Pentane sitting here doing calisthenics. We'll talk more about this in a couple minutes. Um, this, uh, all these motions that you see go on simultaneously, more or less like this, except about 10 to the 6th times per second. Very, very fast. All right, cycloalkanes. It's a very simple concept. Uh, an alkane, we know, is a functional group containing only sp cubed carbons. In a cycloalkane, all we're doing is wrapping them up and putting them into a ring. Now this has an effect on the net formula here. Remember, an alkane is CnH2H2. When we make the ring, we lose two hydrogens, so we're just at CnH2n. Here we have three carbons in a ring. We're going to name this based on the fact that we have three carbons, so it's a propane. Because it is in a ring, we will stick on cyclo in front. All one word. This is cyclopropane. Four carbons in a row. Kind of looks like a square if you draw it. Uh, this is more or less what it looks like in reality. Uh, four carbons is a butte. This is cyclobutane. Five carbons is going to be cyclopentane. And finally, the one that we're going to spend the most time on is this guy, six carbons. This, of course, is cyclohexane. Now, when you go to name a cycloalkane, you're going to do this using basically the same rules that we use for simple alkanes. Of course, we're always going to put cyclohexane as the parent here. And we do have to worry about numbering on the ring, so you know what substituent is at what position on the ring. The standard rule always holds. We look at our number sequences, and we want to do lowest number at the first point of difference, just like it was an open chain. The one thing that we have to uh, think about, if you look at this guy, if we just did lowest number, we could do that as carbon 1, or this one as carbon 1. That makes sense. Therefore, we have this rule. If it's a tie, you simply go alphabetically. Whoever comes first in the alphabet gets carbon number one. So here, we're going to let this be carbon one, and this would be carbon two. We would not go around the ring this way and make this one, six, because again, the lowest number sequence is just one, two. Over here. We have an isopropyl group, an ethyl group, and a methyl group. <clears throat> We're going to do one, two, three in our numbering. Ethyl comes first alphabetically, <coughs> so we'll simply do one, two, three like this. Once you get your numbering down, all you're going to do, just like it was a straight chain, is to list your substituents alphabetically with their numbers and then end up with cyclo whatever it is. So let's just take these two and name them. I'll pause for a moment while you make up a name. When organic chemistry was young, there were no set rules for naming compounds. So if you discovered a compound, you could name it after your child or whatever. Um, that's kind of made it difficult to communicate what things were. There are still what we call name reactions. People that discover a reaction, the reaction gets their name. But um, Hopefully, a lot of that is more or less going away. All right, our parent here is going to be cyclohexane, isn't it? 
We have an ethyl group in carbon one. We have a methyl group in carbon two. Going to string these together. Ethyl is going to come first. And we're simply going to write one ethyl, two methyl cyclohexane. Could you put a dash between the metal? Nope, 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 no dashes. No dashes. <clears throat> well, yes, this, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, dashes, no spaces is what I would say. There are dashes in between all the things. Uh, if you have more than one number, we're going to put commas in, just like we did with a straight chain. So if you no said spaces in the metal, dash, cycle, hexane, that would be Nope, 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 nope. No, 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 no uh, dash here. All right. This is, this is a methylcyclohexane. Once again, this is going to be a cyclohexane. We have an ethyl group in carbon 1, a methyl in carbon 2. Let's call this an isopropyl, just for convenience, in carbon 3. Alphabetically, the, methyl, the ethyl is going to come first. It's going to be one ethyl. 3 isopropyl 2 methyl cyclohexane. Now, the exam will have nomenclature, both straight chain and cycloalkanes. It will also address the concept of stereochemistry, conformations, and we'll get all that today. Yeah? Uh, on the exam, are you going to want us to put a uh, three in methyl ethyl or a three isopropyl? Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. I would probably do uh, isopropyl just for simple things. Isopropyl <coughs> per butyl goes in real pop. Um, sec butyl, I have to sit and figure out what the heck that is. So the ter if, if it would be, to be a terp butyl, it would have another. Uh, Methyl coming off the CH. Yeah, terbutyl, right, we have one more methyl. All right. Off. All right, let's go ahead and do a set. Look at these guys and come up with numbering and names. Now, I know I put the slide handouts online. So, really, if you're not using them, you should. It makes it so much easier than um, having to take notes the old-fashioned way. Our first compound here, we have ethyl and we have two methyls. Alphabetically, ethyl would come first. But remember, the first rule is lowest number at the first point of difference. So, something that you just remember. If we have two things on one carbon, that's pretty much going to be carbon number one. Because that's going to give us a 1-1 one, one in the name. This is carbon one. This <coughs> is carbon two. Again, the number sequence would be 1-1-2 one, one, or 1-2-2. One, 1-1-2 two, two. One, one, two is a lower number sequence. This again is a cyclohexane. In our name, ethyl is going to come first, then our 1,1-dimethyl, 2-ethyl, 1,1-dimethyl, cyclohexane. After tomorrow, after the lab tomorrow, quiz number one will come online. Quiz number one is on Blackboard. Um, in this quiz, you will have the opportunity to enter names for compounds. Type them in. Please remember, because the way Blackboard is, this must be exact. Every comma, every dash, everything perfectly, or it's wrong. So, remember that. Our next guy here, we have a bromine. We have a, a methyl and we have an ethyl. Now once again, alphabetically, bromine would come first, and it will in our name, but the number sequence is going to be better 
if we start down here and go around counterclockwise. That's because this would give us a 1, 2, 4. If we started here, we would have a 1, 3, 5. A 1, 3, 4. Yeah. You, don't, you don't come, when you're doing alphabetical order, you don't come to um, like the abbreviation when you're doing like die or try? No, you don't count die or try. Isopropyl is iso. All right, so in our name, bromine is going to come first. It's going to be a 4 bromo. Then we're going to have a 1 ethyl, 2 methyl cyclohexane. 4 bromo, 1 ethyl, 2 methyl cyclohexane. All one word. We look at this guy, first thing we notice is we have two things on one carbon that pretty much screams at you, I am carbon number one. Are we going to go clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, if we let this be one and we went counterclockwise, our next number would be two. That's the best way to go. So we're going to have substituents in one, two, and five. This is going to be a one chloral. We have a bromine here, so this is a two bromo, a five methyl, and we also have a one methyl. We're going to string all these guys together alphabetically. Bromo is going to come first, chloro, ethyl, and then methyl. Two bromo. One chloro, five ethyl, one methyl cyclohexane. cyclovalcane here is going to be a cyclopentane, isn't it? As we write the name for this, because there's only one substituent, this is by definition going to be carbon-1, but we don't include the 1 in the name. So if there's only one substituent, you don't have to number. All we have to do is say what the substituent is, We'll call this an isopropyl group, and we would simply write isopropyl cyclopentane or methyl ethyl cyclopentane. Yeah? Are both of those answers going to be acceptable on oh, yeah. exams? Oh. Yeah. I think they're acceptable on Blackboard too, I think. But again, as a rule of thumb, do isopropyl okay. and terpyl. First guy here, we have a cyclobutane, don't we? And we have a side chain. When you have a side chain and you have a ring, what you have to do is just simply count to see how many carbons are in the longest chain of your side chain and how many carbons are in your cycloalkane. Well, there are four carbons up here, right? In our side chain, the longest chain would be one, two, three, four, five, six, wouldn't it? Because of that, there are more carbons in the longest chain of the side chain. We're going to name this as the parent, and the cyclobutyl and the methyl simply as substituents.
Well, start numbering down here because cyclobutyl comes before methyl alphabetically. So what we have here is a hexane, six carbons in our chain here. In carbon two, we have a cyclobutyl substituent. In carbon number five, we have a methyl. Simply string them together. Two, cyclobutyl, five, methyl hexane. If we had named this as a cyclobutane, we could call this 1,4-dimethylpentyl, but that would be wrong. If the side chain has more carbons, it is the parent. If it's a tie, and I wouldn't do that to you, but if it's a tie, um, it would go to the cycloalkane. In this one, we have a cyclohexane, six carbons. The longest chain in our side chain here is one, two, three, four, five. So this guy is our parent. Now, I'd like you all not to wait for me to click the button, but to try to name this side chain, just to make sure you can get it. Step one, look at your compound, decide where carbon one's going to be. Well, it's going to be there, isn't it? We are going to go counterclockwise, so that would be one, two. But make sure you can name this thing and number it properly. Remember, carbon number one is always the point of attachment. Well, we should go down and just go around and have a ball chain. <clears throat> no, uh, because this, by definition now, is the parent. We don't start and go from a side chain into a ring. Those they go around the ring and they go into the side chain. Nope. <coughs> nope. Never mind. So whenever there's a ring, it cannot be continuous with the... Right. right. Now, there are polycyclic compounds. We'll see some of those um, where you have um, several rings all fused together. Um, we're not going to name those, although it's really fun. And they have their own sets of numbering rules. One ring attached to the other to the other. But we're not doing that. <coughs> All right, this is going to be carbon one. We're going to go up this way. Carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. Our side chain is going to begin here at carbon one. And it has five carbons. So our side chain is a pentyl group, isn't it? It's a pentyl group with a methyl in carbon two. So we would name this thing as a two methyl pentyl side chain. We're at five methyl, one one, three trimethyl, and in carbon two, we have a 2-methyl pentyl. The branch side chain shows up in parenthesis, no spice, no space, no dash, 2-methyl pentyl cyclohexane. Yeah? Sorry, when you're coming around the ring, why did you go up? Well, if we had gone down, we would have 1, 1, 3 as our sequence. If we go up, we would have 1, 1, 2. Lowest number at the first point of difference. Any question? All right, let's do a real simple one then. Name this guy. Our parent is obviously a cyclopropane, isn't it? 
We have two substituents. Therefore, the numbering is going to be 1, 2. Both of our substituents are methyl groups. So we can call this 1, 2, dimethyl cyclopropane. Now, like I said, that was simple, right? Yeah. Why would it be? Oh, okay. 1, 2, dimethyl cyclopropane. This is what we just named, right? How about this guy? This is also 1, 2, dimethyl cyclopropane, isn't it? But look at it. They're totally different compounds. These are what are referred to. Well, they're isomers, first of all. They have exactly the same molecular formula. They're just connected differently. But they both have two methyl groups on the ring, don't they? The only difference is that this one is pointing down, this one is pointing up. So their spatial arrangement is different. These are called Stereoisomers. Stereoisomers are isomers that simply differ in their arrangement in space. Now we're going to spend an entire chapter talking about stereoisomerism. Right now we're going to do it on a very simple level. Step one, we have to recognize that these are different. If you think about your ring plane here that I've shown in red, on this guy, both methyl groups are sticking out above the ring plane, aren't they? On this one, one's sticking up and one is sticking down. We're going to call these cis and trans isomers. Cis simply means they are on the same side. Trans means they are on opposite sides of our ring plane. If you wanted to name this, you would need to, to say the stereochemistry first. So this isn't just 1,2-dimethylcyclopropane. This is trans 1, 2 dimethyl cyclopropane. This guy is cis 1, 2 dimethyl cyclopropane. Cis, same side, trans, opposite sides. Yeah? That's just for the, the methyl groups, they're either on opposite sides or same side. Yep. So how do you know? Do you only do that if it's if it's known that it's a stereoisomer? That we're looking at? Well, if I gave you this name and I said write the molecule, first thing you would do is write your triangle here. Okay? Then you would say I have two methyl groups. They're at carbons one and two. Because this is trans, I know that one is pointing up and one is pointing down. Would we have to show the hydrogens? You know, you don't have to, but in a drawing like this, if you didn't show the hydrogens, it would be ambiguous. We'll see there's another way to show this using wedge bonds. Wedge bonds, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but a wedge bond, basically, if it's a solid wedge bond, it means it's coming up. If it's a dashed, it means it's going down. So that's a shortcut way. Um, We'll use both, either one, on the exam. But, all right, let's talk a little bit more about cycloalkanes in general. We know that carbon 
is tetrahedral. We know that the bond angle in a carbon compound, um, like an alkane, would like to be 109.5 degrees. Would like to be that. This is cyclopropane. It was supposed to keep rolling. So let's just let it roll. As it goes around, note that this is drawn flat. But not only that, but note all of these hydrogens line up exactly. They're eclipsed, aren't they? Now remember we looked at uh, ethane, and we looked at butane. We decided that the highest energy level associated with something like this was when these hydrogens were eclipsed. And it's true in cycloalkanes too. Cycloalkane, like cyclopropane, we have two things wrong. First of all, our bond angles would really like to be 109, but they're 60, because it's a triangle. This induces what's called ring strain. Cyclopropane is a high energy molecule. It's a high energy molecule because you're putting lots of energy into it to take these tetrahedral carbons and wrap them into a triangle. So it's there as potential energy. If you go to burn this stuff in air, say we act it with oxygen, it will turn to CO2 and water, but as it does, it opens its ring and releases all of its potential energy. So it's a high energy compound. 60 degrees instead of 109, that's a lot of wing strain. There's also another thing that's going on here. Remember when we form covalent bonds? We do that by taking orbitals and we overlap them. In order to overlap them perfectly, they need to be coming straight towards each other. Here, they cannot come straight towards each other. The actual um, angle associated with the orbitals in this is 104 degrees, and that's bad. That's bad for orbital overlap. So we have bad over orbital overlap, and we have bad bond angles. Cycloalkanes all suffer from this. In cyclopropane, once again, we would like to be 109. We're 60. Cyclobutane, nice little square, 90. We're 19 degrees off still. Cyclopentane, we're getting closer. We're at 108. We're just a degree or so off. Cyclohexane, for a perfect um, hexagon, we would have 120 degree angles, so we're 11 degrees off there. All of these have associated ring strain. Now the ring strain is actually largest for the very small rings. This is a plot of strain energy versus ring size. Uh, look at this. This is up to 120 kilojoules. That's a lot of energy <clears throat> that you crammed in to our three-membered cyclopropane ring. Um, cyclobutane is also bad. As we saw, the angles are better for five-member. And here I want you to note a six-membered ring is ranked as zero ring strength. Now, from what we saw on the previous slide, we actually would have thought there would have been some because the angles would be 120 as opposed to 109. And we'll see how it gets away with this in a minute. As your rings get big, energy goes up again, down, up to 14, we're back to zero. That's because they're large and floppy enough that they're not held tightly into some shape. Because we have the ring strain, because the angles in a square would be 90, cycloalkanes distort. A cyclobutane really isn't a 
square. What happens is we get uh, torsion around all of these angles, and we wind up with a puckered square. Now, this puckering goes up, down, back, forth very, very, very fast, but it is not proper in 3D anyway to represent it truly as a square. You'll note that this is better, but we still have inherent uh, bad bond angles. Um, this is still 90 and or about 90, and that just doesn't work. For our five-member ring, we saw this in our intro. The angles are almost right, but this also puckers. If you actually do dynamics on a five-member ring, we get the movie that I showed at the beginning here. Um, this is a calculation, real-time calculation, of <coughs> cyclopentane as it undergoes this puckering. Now, in reality, what happens is each of these carbons will pucker one at a time. They kind of do it randomly, and again, 10 to the 6 times per second. So these are very, very dynamic molecules. A six-member ring. Six-member ring, we said, has zero ring strain, but it shouldn't have. If you flatten the guy out, it would. But, turns out that in a six-member ring, you can take each carbon and you can turn it in such a way that we have perfect tetrahedral carbons all the way around. Perfect tetrahedral carbons. Follow your carbon backbone here. <clears throat> we start here. Going to come down, up, down, up, down, up. That's the same zigzag that you draw when you draw a linear alkane, isn't it? And again, each of these carbons is perfectly tetrahedral. This is called the chair conformation. Go back. Look at this. This end of the molecule is pointing up, isn't it? This end of the molecule is pointing down. Hence, our chair. It's a little lounge chair. Pointing up at one end, rises, goes down. This is the chair conformation of cyclohexane. So did yeah. you say that it becomes like tetrahedral, like for a moment, like it, it moves into tetrahedral? Well, it is very dynamic still, but every carbon can achieve perfect tetrahedral geometry. At some point in time. At some point in time. That's why the total ring strain is very, very low. All right. The chair conformation of cyclohexane is going to be very, very important to us. because we're going to be able to define the stereochemistry of substituents attached using the chair as our reference point. I'd like you to look at this. If you note, we have a carbon here with a hydrogen pointing straight up, right? Here's one with a hydrogen pointing straight down, straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down. These guys that are pointing straight up, relative to the ring plane, are called axial substituents. So you look at the general shape of our ring. You define the equator. Now, relative to the equator, we're going up and down, up and down, up and down. So it's the average of all the ups and downs. Relative to this plane that we've just defined, these guys, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, these guys are all perpendicular. 
They're perfectly 90 degrees relative to the ring plane. These are called axial substituents, axial <coughs> bonds, if you will. Now, if these guys are axial, and these guys must be defined as being in the ring plane. They are called equatorial substituents. They go around the equator. Now, it's true they're pointing up and down slightly, but they're in the same ring plane as the carbons. So we have two types of substituents associated with a chair cyclohexane. We have axial that are going up and down, and we have equatorial that are in the plane. All right, now comes the really important part. You are going to learn how to draw a perfect cyclohexane showing axial and equatorial substituents. Why? Because on your exam, and for the rest of your life, artwork matters. You've got to be able to draw these compounds so that very clearly you can represent axial and equatorial. So, what we're going to do is learn how to make this guy. This is our backbone, and on each of these are hydrogens. They're tough to see on the white screen, so let's put in a background. This is what we're going to do. And I really want you to do this with me in real time and practice it, because honestly, artwork does count on this exam. So, step one, we're going to look and draw our carbon backbone. Carbon backbone, we're going to start here arbitrarily. It's going to go down, up, down, up, down, up. So what you draw is simply that. And you make it beautiful. Now remember, on every carbon, we have an axial substituent, don't we? Here we're going to have one pointing straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down, up, and down. So step two, put in your axial bonds. Straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down, up, and down. Now comes the tough part, and that's putting in the equatorial bonds. Every carbon has an equatorial bond. But remember, they kind of point um, up and down a little bit as you go around the ring. The trick on this is the fact that you've drawn a perfect carbon backbone to start with. Let's work on the end carbons first. They're the easiest. See these two bonds here, this one and this one? You've drawn those perfectly parallel in your drawing. These two should be perfectly parallel. The bond here and here is also going to be perfectly parallel with these two. So what you do is you use this and this as a reference and simply put in 
your bond here, and your bond here. Now, it's a little more difficult, but if you note, let me make sure which one comes next. If you note, as you constructed your ring here, not only were these two parallel, but these two are also parallel. The bond here and here are going to be parallel to these things. You can kind of look across the ring. So here's the bond that you drew to start with. This one here is the one that you're talking about. So this is going to look like this. This one, straight across from it, is going to look like that. Put them together. That's our next set of bonds. And finally, we also made these guys perfectly parallel when we did our drawing. So this and this are parallel. And our last two remaining carbons, this one and this one, their equatorial bonds are going to be parallel to these. So we put them in. And that's our structure. We have just drawn a perfect cyclohexane. Please practice this. One of the great agonies of teaching organic chemistry is grading exams where people are lousy artists. Artwork really does matter. And, you know, there actually is something to, to be said for that. On exams, you will be asked to draw structures. Now, you can take the correct structure and you can make just a really lousy, ugly drawing of it. And whoever's grading this has to sit and look at it and say, well, yeah, I think so. Okay? Or you could actually have your structure wrong and make it absolutely beautiful. And who's ever grading it will look at it and say, God, that looks so nice, it must be right, and move on. So think about that as well. That goes for a lot in life, actually. All right, so learn how to do this. Please practice. Yeah. Do you allow um, rulers? Don't use a ruler. Just get so you can do it. Zip, 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 zip. That's it. It'll take you way too long. I've actually had people bring templates with cyclohexane <laughs> templates on them. You can use that if you want. Yeah, I don't care. But uh, if you don't need to do that, just do it. All right, this is, well, let's see, let's, that wasn't supposed to start yet. Well, gee, this isn't going to stop for me either. We just drew perfect cyclohexane, right? We know that cycloalkanes are very dynamic, that they can undergo puckering, etc. Let's just start somewhere here. Hang on a second. This guy. The ring plate is going this way. Our reds are all axial, the blue are all equatorial. When this undergoes a couple puckers, you'll note that, by gosh, now, all the blues are axial and all the reds are equatorial. 
Watch this go back and forth a few times. The blues are axial. Now the reds are axial. To change, all we do is grab one end, move it up. Grab the other end, move it down. Suddenly, blues are axial, reds are equatorial. This is called a ring flip. Cyclohexane undergoes ring flips or ring inversions very, very rapidly. Once again, about a million times a second. What this means is, if you have a substituent in an equatorial position and it undergoes a ring inversion, suddenly that's in an axial position. So axial, equatorial are in this equilibrium. In a ring inversion, everything that was axial will become equatorial, and everything that was equatorial will become axial. Now, as this happens, note once we ring, bring this end up, we get this structure. This is called bolt cyclohexane, as opposed to chair. Let's watch it again. This is chair. This end comes up. And now we have bolt. <clears throat> end goes down, and we're back to chair. Let's look a little bit at the boat. The boat is this intermediate. Boat cyclohexane would look something like this. What's wrong with this? Think about whatever, everything we've said about eclipse interactions. Everything is wrong with this. If we take this guy and we turn it on end, everything lines up, doesn't it? Everything is eclipsed. Boat cyclohexane is a high energy intermediate. As it's high energy, it doesn't really stop there. It does exist, but it doesn't stop there as a stable point. And actually, boat cyclohexane doesn't really look like this. This is idealized. What happens is because of all the eclipsing interactions, we get what's called the twist boat that looks kind of like this. It's a boat that has kind of contorted itself a bit and to try to avoid all of this eclipsing. So the boat cyclohexane is an intermediate. If we start in a chair, go to the other chair, we have to go through the boat and again it's a high energy intermediate. This is chair cyclohexane and this is boat. Any questions? In what uh, like stage is it like more stable? Well, we're going to talk about stability now. The chair is always going to be the most stable. But remember, you can have two chairs. Because our boat is the intermediate. Drag this end up, make it like this. And we would drag this end down to make the opposite chair. Let's look at it this way. Here we have two methyl cyclohexane. This is our first chair here. Now I've just drawn the hydrogens in to make it clear. This is clearly an equatorial methyl, isn't it? Now remember, as we undergo ring inversion, we, we take this carbon and move it down, like this. Take this carbon, move it up, to here. 
When we do that, everything that is equatorial here becomes axial. Now, turns out that these two guys are not <coughs> energetically equal. In fact, this equilibrium is tilted this way so that this is the more favored intermediate. If I spoke of this intermediate, I would say this is in its most stable conformation. If I ask you to draw methyl cyclohexane in its most stable conformation, you would put the methyl group equatorial. Now why? Basically it has to do with eclipsing again. If we look at the axial methyl group here, I'm sorry, equatorial methyl, we have three axial hydrogens, don't we? <clears throat> These are all pointing up. They're kind of like eclipsing each other. It's not really bad. But here, where we put the methyl axial, because the methyl is so much larger than a hydrogen, we have big time interaction between here and these guys. This is called steric hindrance. Steric re refers to size. Hindrance is a bad thing. <clears throat> steric hindrance means this is less stable than this guy. Methyl group here is dangling out on this side, and all we have is hydrogens. Here we have methyl hydrogens. The bottom line of all of this, now in the book there's a table and it's got energies in it as to how big something is, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry about that. The bottom line is equatorial is good, axial is bad. If you have more than one substituent, the more equatorials you have, the better it is. The more axials you have, the worse it is. Equatorial is good. How does uh, electronegativity, like, uh, or size of the atom, place? Electronegativity doesn't enter into this. Simply steric hindrance. Simply based on size. Consider bromocyclohexane. <clears throat> you thought methyl was big. A bromine is much, much bigger. Here we have a bromine that's equatorial. Here we have a bromine that's axial. This is very bad. The equilibrium strongly favors equatorial. What if we put just a simple alkyl group? We saw a methyl group uh, does have an effect. How about ethyl cyclohexane? Here I've taken ethyl cyclohexane and I've put it axial. Now you might think that this is really not much different than methyl. You just have a CH2 sticking up here, two hydrogens to mess with. But remember this carbon-carbon bond rotates. <coughs> and as it does, this methyl group swings around like a club. And as it does, here are the axial hydrogens. You see it just totally hits each of these at every turn. That means the alkyl group sticking up is very, very unstable. Once again, bottom line, equatorial is good, axial is bad. The ultimate in all of this is the tert butyl group. If we have a tert butyl, that's a carbon with three hydrogens attached, this equilibrium is so unfavorable that this ring is frozen in this position. <clears throat> Again, the rule, if 
If it's a turf yield group, it must be equatorial. Period. Think about it. Here's our little tiny ring here. Here's our big honk and turf mutal group. If you took and you tried to push this down here, it would just totally occupy all of this space. This is the space filling version of that. Again, this is a huge basketball. You just cannot push it axially. Any questions? Yeah. All right. So for it to be most stable, whenever you have a methyl or certain butyl or, or a halogen, it always wants to be more favorable, favorable to be equatorial. That's right. Axial. If you have more than one substituent, the most stable conformation will have the most equatorial groups. And, then, and we'll do this problem in class today. We'll do it on the exam. So let's make sure we get it. And then also, let's just say you had two turf butyls. One was axial and one was equatorial. It would freeze the then pH it would make, coat. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> turf butyl must be equatorial. All right. If we have axials and equatorials, we can have isomerism on our six-member ring, just like we did with cyclopropane. So let's review that. With cyclopropane, we said we could have two stereoisomers, <clears throat> one where the groups were attached on the same side, that was cis, and one where the groups were on opposite sides as trans. If we have a four-member ring, a cyclobutane, we can have substituents in carbons one and two, one and two, that are likewise on the same side, so they're cis, on opposite sides, so they're trans. But because we have four carbons in our ring, we can also have substituents at carbons one and four. Now for these, you do the same thing. You look at your ring plane. These are on opposite sides of the ring plane, they're trans. These are on the same side of our ring plane. They are cis. So we have four stereoisomers, or four isomeric forms of our cyclobutane, where we have two substituents. Or a five-member ring. We can have a substituent in carbons one and two. That would be cis. Carbons one and two, opposite sides of the plane, this is going up, that's going down, they're trans. Wait. These, look, look at where the bond goes. This goes up, this goes up, the cis. This goes up, goes down, it's trans. So the first one was the tutorial, the tutorial was the Right, it, <clears throat> it, it does. It's so much more subtle. Here we have substituents in one and three. These are both heading up. They are cis. One up, one heading down. These are trans. Now remember, because it's a five-member ring, this carbon and this carbon are equivalent. So if we put this back here, it's still the same thing. This would be trans. <coughs> One up, one down. So both uh, molecules like a group, it could be in the same actual uh, bond, um, bond, but it could be uh, trans per se. Yep, cis or trans. <coughs> All right, let's do our friend here, cycloalkane. We can come up with six 
isomers as we go around the ring. Let's start off with something in carbons one and two. Here we have at carbon one an equatorial group. At carbon two, we have an axial group. Look at your ring plane. This is going up, that's going up, this is going to be cis. If we had this one equatorial and this one also equatorial, this is going up, this is going down, this is going to be trans. If we had substituents at carbons one and three, this is equatorial, that's equatorial, they're both going up, that's going to be cis. Going up, going down, this one's going to be trans. Carbons one and four, going up, going up, cis, axial, equatorial, cis, equatorial, equatorial, up, down, trans. You see why it's important to be able to draw these things perfectly? So that you can clearly see that this is heading up, this is heading down, and it's a trans isomer. These three, we will, here's our ring plane once again. <clears throat> again, up and up, up and down relative to our plane. These three, we will group as cis, and these three we will group as trans. Now the exercise that we do in this chapter is to look at various forms of cyclohexanes and their substituents. We have to be able to name them, so we have to know if we have something at 1 and 3 and it's axial equatorial, we're going to call that trans. That's the exercise. So let's do it. Let's say we have this as a structure. It's a bone. And let's say the question is, draw this in its most stable conformation. Well, what you would do is to take your boat here and say, OK, in order to make this into a chair, all I have to do is grab one end and move it down. Now when I do that, this end is still pointing up, this end is now pointing down, and I've made a chair. So that's step one. You look at this, and you say to yourself, here we're just pulling this down, you look at this and say, <clears throat> We have, well, I've done this, and I've tipped it a little bit to make the axial lines nice and vertical so I can see them. But in this conversion that we've done, we've left two chlorines axial. So on your little piece of paper right now, Take this, convert this chair to the most stable chair, and draw it perfectly. We know we cannot leave these chlorines axial, can we? If we do a ring inversion, they're both going to be equatorial. Everything is axial becomes equatorial. What you have to do is draw that. Now, it's not as hard as it seems. <clears throat> what we want to do is simply flip each end 
to get the other chair. The operation looks like this. I'm going to grab this, move it up, grab this guy, move it down. When we do this, we have our new chair. So this is now pointing up, this is now pointing down. Everything that was axial is now equatorial. This is the most stable confirmation. Yeah? So, like, you kind of took the chlorine on the left and then you rotated it uh, counterclockwise? Yeah, well, good. what I did to get from here to here, you mean? Yeah. Step one, I grabbed this and I pulled it down. Yeah. Okay? Now, to me, visually, I can see axial and equatorial best if the axial bonds, these guys, are vertical. So as I pulled this down, I redrew it so that these would now be vertical. It's just tipping the ring slightly. I've got another slide that shows that a little bit better. Can you, like, rotate the uh, chlorine on the right? Wow. Or counterclockwise to get like it coming out. This guy, you mean? No, the one like this guy. Or I'm looking at the triangle on the right. Yeah, you could take and rotate this guy down and get here directly. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you could. I have a question uh, for that one. Um, if you rotate like those chlorines, is it the same thing? Is it stable still? Like. Do they have the same stability? Like, um, if you put that chlorine into the hydrogen on top, but they, they remain the equatorial. Um, yeah, remember, you're not breaking any bonds here. You're not breaking any bonds. All you're doing is grabbing one end, moving it up or down. It's a simple ring. How, how does that make it more stable? Well, it's more stable because, first of all, this is a boat. You know, boat's bad. B is for bad. <laughs> Here we have done, um, made a chair, but it's a bad chair. Because the chlorines are both axial. <coughs> axial, that means that they're really interfering with everything here. <laughs> so we take and we do a ring inversion. Now we're equatorial. They're out of everybody's way. This is what questions look like on the exam. So let's go ahead and do some of these. The question will be, draw the following compound in its most stable conformation. Now you know how I really do this, <clears throat> to be honest. We show this like grabbing corners and moving them up and down and stuff like that. The way I do it, <clears throat> and the way I suggest you might think about, is to say, okay, this is bad. I have a turbutyl group here that's axial. Oh my goodness. I know that has to be equatorial. So what I do is I say, okay, I'm just going to draw myself a chair, a skeleton. Okay? And then I'm going to look and say, here, this was axial, so over here it's going to be equatorial. This was equatorial, it's now going to be axial. This was axial, it will now be equatorial. <laughs> When we do that, we wind up with a structure like this. This was axial, it's now equatorial. This was equatorial, it's now axial. Axial, equatorial. Everything simply swaps.
Now with this next one, you have to start here and come up with a chair. So the way I would do it is to draw my chair. Just draw a chair. Okay? I'm going to have substituents at carbons 1, 2, and 4. Right? So I put in my axial and equatorial lines. Now, I look at my boat and I say, okay, this methyl is above this hydrogen. It's above it, spatially. It's not going to change. It's always going to be above it. This hydrogen is always going to be above this methyl, and so is this one. So when I draw my new structure, even though I do it by doing this, this methyl is going to be above this hydrogen. <clears throat> so this is this carbon. The methyl is above the hydrogen. This guy, hydrogen up, methyl down. Hydrogen up, methyl down. Hydrogen up, methyl down, up, down. So if you just draw the skeleton, put in your bonds, and then look at them spatially, who's on top? Him, him, him. It'll make it much, much easier. <clears throat> we wound up here with a structure where we have two methyl groups that are axial. Now, we're not in our boat anymore, but is this the most stable? No. We want the two methyl groups to be equatorial. So what I would do right now is I'd slap myself in the head, say I drew the wrong chair, and I'd draw another one. Everything that was axial becomes equatorial. Everything that was equatorial becomes axial. Would in this case be the boat more uh, structurally sound? Because all the metal groups are facing out, or all the metal groups are facing out in the boat instead of the, right. of the chair. So um, it would be more uh, structurally sound. Well, Is there all, if uh, you were trying to force something bigger axial here. I mean, that's a good point. If this was a bromine, for example, then the most stable structure would be much more boat like. But let's don't do that. Let's just simply count equatorials. Okay? We're going to assume the most stable is a chair, the most equatorials is best. Take this guy, draw it in the most stable. We have two axial methyls here, don't we? That's bad. We're going to have to draw a new chair, <coughs> and we're going to have to put both of these at the floor. So. Buy yourself a chair, put in bonds at carbons 1 and 3, both axial methyls must be equatorial. Now they're pointing out, and that's better. This guy is a boat again. <clears throat> Once again, I would simply draw a chair. I would put my bonds in on carbons one and three. <clears throat> methyl is going to be above hydrogen, hydrogen above methyl. 
So you take the chair that you drew with these empty bonds, put methyl up, hydrogen down, hydrogen up, methyl down. Methyl up, methyl above hydrogen, methyl above hydrogen, hydrogen above methyl, hydrogen above methyl. Yeah? So the rule of thumb is when you're making the from that um, bullet to a chair, you always think that the methyl group is above the hydrogen, so it's always got to be the methyl group above the hydrogen, right? Right. Just, just remember you're not going to break any bonds. So that relationship is so always going to hold. Shape. Yep. All right, these are the simple ones. These are called fused rings. Now, we're actually not going to have a fused ring on the exam, so don't freak out. But just for jollies, look at these two and let's draw them as fused chairs. So what you would do is say, okay, I'm going to start here with this cyclohexane, and I'm just going to draw a chair. Because I know how to do that, right? Now, where are these two rings join? Let's make it here. We're going to have axial and equatorial bonds. See these little wedgies? That's what I was referring to in terms of showing stereochemistry with wedge bonds. This bond that grows as it comes up means that this hydrogen is coming towards us. This with the hydrogen going down means that it's going away. Another way to say it is these two are trans to each other. So, in a 1-2 position like this, our trans would be hydrogen up, hydrogen down. Now these are our two other equatorial positions, right? But they are occupied by the rest of this ring. So all you have to do to draw it is to say, well this is just the nose, isn't it? So the rest of my ring looks like that. And then you change it from red to black. This is a trans ring junction. All trans because hydrogen's at the junction, so one up, one down. Things like cholesterol is a series of fused rings. In cholesterol, all of the ring junctions are trans, making the molecule big and flat. We can also have a cis ring junction. Here the two hydrogens are pointing up, so they're on the same side, aren't they? So let's draw this the same way. Here's our ring with the two hydrogens pointing up, axial and equatorial. Now on each carbon, we also have an equatorial and an axial thing here. This is going to be the nose of this ring. So all we do is take our nose, these guys, Draw the rest of our ring and fill it in. Cis ring junction, hydrogens are cis, trans ring junction. All steroids only have cis ring junction. I'm sorry, trans ring junctions. As you can see, the shape of the molecule changes dramatically if we change that steroid.
All right. <clears throat> Let's kind of work some problems about everything that we've done today. Go ahead and draw a structure for trans 1,3 dibromo cyclopentane. First of all, draw it as a cyclopentane where you can show stereochemistry with bonds going up and down, and then draw it with wedges. For a cyclopentane, you simply need to draw the five number ring. You identify positions one and three. And this is trans, so you're going to have one bromine pointing up and one bromine pointing down. Something like this would work perfectly. Positions one and three, one bromine up, one bromine down. Does it matter where you put the bromine? Doesn't matter at all. Now, if we drew this as wedges, what we would do is draw our five numbered ring flat. And then we would have to show, using our wedge bonds, one bromine up and one bromine down. And that would work. Those two are equivalent structures. We have a cyclohexane. So you want to draw a perfect chair. You have substituents in one and three. So you want to put axial and equatorial bonds in on one and three. <clears throat> Stereochemistry is cis. So the isopropyl group and the methyl must be on the same side of our ring plane. Here is our perfect cyclohexane ring. We have substituents at 1 and 3. <coughs> Our stereochemistry is cis. That means that this and this must both be equatorial. Wouldn't the, the isopropyl be where the methyl is? Doesn't matter. But it's saying 1 isopropyl. Well, this is carbon 1. Where you have to start. It's carbon 1, 2, doesn't matter how you draw it. Look at it flat. If we drew this using wedge bonds, we would draw our perfect hexagon. We would show a methyl and an isopropyl as either coming towards us on the same side, or you could use dash bonds and make them both going back. Doesn't matter. In chapter 5, it'll matter, but now it doesn't matter. Draw cyclopentyl methyl cyclopentane. Yeah. Version. Sometimes I'll ask for a flat, sometimes I will ask for a chair. Okay. If I ask for a chair, don't give me a flat. Yeah. Cyclopentyl methyl cyclopentane. Our parent here is going to be cyclopentane, isn't it? So you draw your five number ring. Our side chain here is cyclopentyl methyl. Now remember, the second word in our side chain is where it's attached. So 
this carbon, the methyl carbon, the cyclopentyl methyl, is attached to the cyclopentane. Attached to this, this carbon is another cyclopentane ring. And it would look like that. <clears throat> Let's call this the parent. This is our side chain. This carbon, single carbon, is the point of attachment. And that has a cyclopentyl group attached to it. Cyclopentyl methyl cyclopentyl. No need a number. No need stereochemistry because there's only one. Uh, Wouldn't that be ethyl? No, it's only one carbon. Only one carbon. Uh -huh. I'm going to look at your composition. Hmm? Did you draw a chair? No, we wouldn't have to. Not for this. Okay. Not sure. <clears throat> That's too much information. <laughs> Cyclopropane is our parent. We have a chlorine in carbon one, a methyl in carbon two, and they are trans. So you want to draw your cyclopropane kind of on its side a little bit so you can show the stereochemistry nicely. You want a chlorine pointing up, methyl pointing down. And that would work. If we drew this using wedge bonds, we would draw our perfect little triangle. We would show one up and one down. You could also show this one up and this one down. It's always the opposite. We have a cyclobutane. Again, draw the cyclobutane kind of on its side, squished a little bit. So we can show right, carbons one and three, two methyl groups that are trans. You draw your cyclopropane or cyclobutane as kind of a rhombus. Do you remember geometry? And you put one methyl up and one methyl down. See, this sounds hard, but it is. If we do it flat, we would take a square and we would simply show one methyl up, one methyl down. Hexyl cyclooctane. Cyclooctane is our parent. It has a hexyl side chain. So we simply draw a stop sign. And to that we attach six carbons. One more set. One methyl three nitro cyclopentane. Nitro group, remember functional groups. Nitro group is simply an NO2 bound to the nitrogen. Cyclopentane. We have substituents at one and three, and they're cis. So you draw a kind of a squished cyclopentane ring, go to carbons one and three, one bond up, one bond down. I'm sorry, they're cis. So they're both on the same side, both bonds down. 
nitro group, and a CH3. If we flatten it out, we could draw this, <coughs> little dashed wedges, again showing they're both going back, but most importantly they're on the same side. We could also draw big wedges to show they're coming towards us on the same side. Again, in chapter 5, we will see that this and this are actually different compounds. But we're not going to do that yet. And finally, cyclohexane. Draw a perfect chair. Go to carbons 1 and 2. Put in axial equatorial bonds. Our stereochemistry is trans, so they must be on opposite sides of the ring. And we want to make them equatorial if we can. One, two, diequatorial. This is going down, this is going up. They're trans. As a wedge bond, six membered ring, one up, one down. Let's take sort of a break. And let's just very quickly run through these. These are samples of what multiple choice questions might look like on this exam. We'll break, like I said, for about five minutes, and then we'll work. Molecule show below is trans 13 dimethylcyclohexane. Looking for a cyclohexane with methyl groups and carbons 1 and 3. And they must be trans. <clears throat> Start down here in D. We have an axial methyl, another axial methyl. Those are bad, aren't they? That's an unstable conformation. But they're on the same side of the plane, so that's cis, isn't it? This is coming up. This is coming up. They're both equatorial, but they're still both coming up. This is cis. Both going down at the same side, they're cis. Here we have one up, one down. This is our trans isomer. Any questions? Here we're looking for trans 1, 4. Do it the same way. You can actually remember that 1, that 1, 4 means that if they're both equatorial they will be trans, if they're both axial they will be trans. But you don't have to do that. You can simply do this in real time. First of all we're looking for 1,4 aren't we? What's, what are these two? They're 1 and 3 aren't they? 
We could rule this guy out right away. How about this one? That's one, three. That's gone. Now this guy is one, four, and so is this. Here we have a methyl equatorial, so it's going down. Axial, so it's going down. This is cis. This guy, <clears throat> both of our hydrogens are axial, which means that both of these are equatorial. So this is trans. So two of these are one, three. Forget those. <clears throat> this one is clearly cis. The way this is drawn, you have to think about it a little bit. But it's easy to identify that the hydrogens are axial. If they're axial, methyls must be equatorial. All right, if we do a ring flip, which of these will revert to a more stable stereoisomer? Here we have two equatorials. We ring flip, they both become axial. That's bad. Here we have two equatorials. We ring flip. They're axial. That's bad. Axial equatorial. We ring flip. We have axial equatorial. No change. Up here, we have two, two axial. They will both become equatorial. And that's good. So for like the exam, would we have multiple choice questions like this? There will be some. Here we have a molecule. <clears throat> Which statement is true? In its most stable confirmation, both methyl groups will be equatorial. Well, Let's think about that one. We have axial equatorial, right? If we do a ring flip, our two methyls are still going to be axial equatorial. They just swap. So that'd be impossible. Yeah, I mean we're not breaking any bonds. <clears throat> our methyl groups are always going to be cis. Period. B. Most stable confirmation: both methyls will be axial. Can't do that either, because they will always be axial equatorial, just swap positions. At most stable confirmation, the chlorine will be equatorial. Now let's look at that one. If we do a ring flip here, this and this will both become equatorial. And this one will be axial. So in the most stable conformation, this would give us two groups, equatorial, one axial. Finally, in this most stable, all substituents will be equatorial. Yeah, that would be nice, but we can't do that because we don't break any bonds, do we? Two methyls will always be cis to each other. <clears throat> Therefore, we make these two equatorial, this one's axial. Another one. <clears throat> Here we have this guy. In the most stable conformation, the methyl group will be equatorial. Most stable, the methyl group and the chlorine will be axial. The isopropyl will be axial. 
all substituents will be equatorial. Well, clearly the last one has to be long, right? <clears throat> because we have a mix of x axial equatorial now, that's not going to change. <clears throat> if we simply count <clears throat> numbers of equatorial groups, here we have two axial, one equatorial. If we ring flipped, we would have two equatorial, one axial. Simply based on counting, that's going to be better. So if we ring flip here, this methyl becomes equatorial. And that's the best answer. <clears throat> methyl group in the chlorine will be axial. Well, no, there's two axials, one equatorial. Um, here, isopropyl group will be axial. Yeah, well, this is actually be, true guess, also. Uh, yeah, this one, so if this is equatorial now, it will be axial. So this is also true. Bad question. Isn't that more true? Well, <clears throat> this is actually bigger. You know, this is where you go to the book and you look at the table of energies. The isopropyl is bigger than the chlorine? Uh, isopropyl is probably the same size as the chlorine. Okay. So, uh, when you look at the table of energies, this and this are about the same size. So, the methyl group is what really makes the difference. So what we see that. In, in fact, what you pointed out earlier. <coughs> <clears throat> this is going to be a more bogish than it's going to be a root here. Yeah. For that one, uh, the previous one, would would C be true then? Yes, it is. Okay. So it is C. A and C. It's more C than that. Yeah, it's um, A and C. So, bad question. Sorry. All right, <clears throat> which of the below represents the isomer form when we invert A? So if we do a ring flip on A, what do we get? Are you showing a ring flip in any of those answers? Because like, they're are both on the same side. Well, <clears throat> these are both on the same side. They're cis, that's right. The ring isn't changing. But when they flip, we're still going to have methyls 1 and 3 that are cis. So, question is, which of these are methyl groups 1 and 3 and cis? Here we have a methyl up, methyl down. That's trans, isn't it? Methyl up, methyl down. That's trans. <clears throat> we have methyl down, methyl down. This is also methyl down, methyl down, except these two are 1, 2, aren't they? Here we're 1, 3. Would, wouldn't the chair have to be facing the other direction? Doesn't matter how it faces, remember it's spinning in real time. Oh, okay. You can make it face any way you want. Okay. Just look at your substituents. 1, 3, 6. Another one. Some rates were <laughs> We have substituents at one, three, and five. We have <laughs> axial, axial and equatorial. So we're looking for equatorial, equatorial, <laughs> and axial. This is these are at one. Sorry, one, two, and four. So this one's out. This is one, two, and four. It's out. This one is one, three, and four. Or five. That's good. One, three, five. This is good. So which of these two works? C. C. Our chlorine and our <coughs> the chlorine must be equatorial. 
this must be equatorial, and this must be axial. What? Shoot. So Ignore that right. little blob. These two must be equatorial. This one must be axial. Sorry about that. Erase it. Hold my hand in front of it. <coughs> this is the correct answer. This is one, two, four. So the that's why that's they're all axial, right? right? No, they're all equatorial. No, this is equatorial, equatorial, axial, and <clears throat> this is equatorial, equatorial, axial. Right, but it's just is wrong because they're all axial. Right. Or equatorial. equatorial. All right, what can we say about this guy? This is DMC essentially the same answer. Yeah. Yeah, D is yeah, the same. Uh, DMC is essentially the same answer, right? No, for this no, 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 not for this one, but for this the is question. the correct answer. Right, I understand that. But I'm saying for the next question, D and C are the same answer. And this would be. Because it, that's how it is right now. Sure. Well, let's look at this. In the most stable, both methyl groups will be equatorial. Well, we have two methyl groups that are axial. This guy is equatorial, right? So in the most stable, we're going to ring flip and make both of these equatorial. In the most stable, both methyls will be axial. Well, that's what we have now. So that's two axial and equatorial. Not good. In the most stable, chlorine will be equatorial. That's where it is now. In the most stable, all will be equatorial. That would be nice, but we can't do that. Okay, so I'm confused about something. Um, you said that the chlorine is always going to have to be um, equatorial because it's bigger than a methyl group, right? It so is bigger. So we have two but, methyl groups. But here we have chlorine. two methyls. So if you have two methyl chlorine. groups, it overrides the size yeah. of the chlorine. So okay. when will the size come to become normal? When does what? Like when did the, the size of like. You know, as far as um, this course, we are just going to count axials and equatorials. Okay. The only time we really worry about size is terpbutyl. Okay. Terpbutyl is always equatorial, period. Period. So for now, the rule of thumb is the more equatorial to have, the better your house. Yep. Oh, that was it. So, the rule is 